studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton. This is Yahoo Finance Live. And here's what we're watching this afternoon. Markets taking a pause on the recent rally, the Dow pulling back from nearly four month highs. Investors about to wrap up the month of November, but Wall Street, of course, is already looking ahead, of course, as it usually does, and it's looking bullish. We'll have the latest outlooks from top strategists coming up. And a huge weekend for retail with the holiday shopping season in full swing now. And the deals aren't done yet. A few hours left to shop this Cyber Monday. But we're taking a look at how the consumer is really doing right now. And some of the big winners on Wall Street might not be what you're expecting. And move over UPS and FedEx. The biggest shipper in the U.S. is now Amazon and the margins growing. What that means for the tech giant later this hour. Let's get you up to speed on the market action right now. Uh, when you look at the major averages, they've kind of been bouncing around a little bit today. So not a lot of decisive action here coming off of uh, the long weekend, the Thanksgiving holiday. The Nasdaq today up uh, four one hundredths of one percent. Very small move. The Dow down about 68 points, a small move as well, down about a fifth of one percent. Uh, the S&P 500 down about the same here. When you look at the groups that are on the move today, energy under some pressure here, as well as healthcare and financials, real estate and consumer discretionary stocks are in the green. But again, not seeing a lot of outsized moves today. All right. And we turn now to our top story, the state of the consumer. Today is the last day of that busy holiday shopping weekend. According to data from Adobe, shoppers spent a record $10.3 billion in online sales for the past few days. It's a 7.7% increase year over year. E-commerce stocks like Amazon, Shopify are pushing higher on that sales momentum. So Adobe Julie is always great on the stats of where your sort of your friends, your neighbors mm -hmm. are shopping. Reading through the report, some interesting stats I thought that pulled out to me. One, they think consumers on this Cyber Monday, you're going to drop about 12, between 12 and 12.4 billion. That would be a record. Adobe says that actually beats their initial forecast. Comes, by the way, after Black Friday, which also came in above what they were looking for. That clocked in at 9.8 billion. What is hot on Cyber Monday, Julie? That's what you want to know, right? Here's what your, your friends and family are looking for. Headphones, smart watches, Barbie dolls, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Nintendo Switch for the gamers that you know. And we know things are kind of uncertain out there, so perhaps not too surprising. Adobe Senior seeing retailers are really offering record high discounts in categories, electronics and furniture. Yeah, that's something that we talked about with Ted Rossman of, of Bankrate last week as well. Also, uh, the rise in the buy now, pay later trend is something that Adobe is also monitoring, uh, that it is up 18.8% year over year. That's their expectation for the increase in buy now, pay later on this Cyber Monday. Now, you mentioned some of the stocks are being affected. Our firm is one of the stocks that we're watching, of course, buy now, pay later. Uh, pure play here, we're watching Shopify as well. That stock is trading at about an 18-month high. And I've seen some of the analyst commentary. A lot of it has been very positive on Shopify specifically here. Um, Raymond James, for example, saying the company's outperformance via, versus the broader commerce landscape is impressive, and that's sort of the vibe that you're getting from a lot of analysts. The analysts, when you're talking about Black Friday more generally, are not necessarily as impressed, or at least, at the very least, a little bit more mixed. Even though these numbers sound big, they say it doesn't necessarily reflect like huge, huge gains, right, when you're looking at year over year uh, for some of these, and it's really going to be spotty depending on the retailers and where you're looking. I mean, you know, listen, that dovetails with a lot of analysts and strategists we've been talking to, this kind of caution that we've heard. I would, you know, one other point, though, in that Adobe report that I thought was interesting. Adobe's numbers are not inflation adjusted, but they noted online prices are actually down 6% year right. over year. So that does suggest the uptick here is due to stronger demand. We'll see, we'll I see. guess, when we get more data here. Uh, it was indeed a Black Friday for the ages. We saw some blockbuster numbers coming in from Adobe Analytics. We were just running through them. And Cyber Monday could show big numbers, too. Our next guest, though, is raising some concerns about how the consumer is really doing. Let's bring in Eric Sterner, Apollon Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer, to talk more about this. Um, so let's dig into what you're watching that is saying to you, OK, some of these numbers look good, but maybe some other numbers are showing us that there could be a little bit of trouble ahead. What are those numbers? 
Yeah, well, thanks for having me on the show. And I think, um, you know, we're just starting to see some deterioration on the consumer. The, the consumer has been extremely resilient as the Fed has raised rates, but we're starting to see consumer debt hit record levels, uh, credit um, loan, car loan delinquencies at its highest level in, in three decades. And all the excessive savings that were built up during the pandemic and the government stimulus, we're hearing more and more that the top 20% of affluent clients still are in good shape from excessive savings, but their other 80% have almost exhausted all those savings. And the cost of living ha has gone up dramatically, as we all know, in the past two years. Yes, inflation is slowing down, but still, you know, we're, we're seeing grocery prices 20% uh, higher over the past two years, gasoline 40%, housing 30%. So that's the cost of living has gone up and excessive savings are being dwindling down. Um, I'm a little concerned about the consumer and, and how that could affect the economy. And so, Eric, so some storm clouds you're pointing out for the consumer. What does that mean, Eric, for just kind of your broader outlook on the U.S. economy as we roll into to 2024? You know, obviously, you know, Eric, a lot of investors have been more comfortable with this idea that inflation is going to fall back down to the Fed's 2 percent target without an economic downturn. Is that where you're at? Um, I, I think it's possible that we could. Uh, the, the Fed could execute a soft landing. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot of good news in the stock market between um, the bond yields dropping, um, some more welcome CPI and PPI reports. Um, and and we, we've seen corporate earnings break out of its recession, uh, producing positive results after, after three negative quarters. But I just think there's a lot of good news pricing in the market between the soft landing, um, expectations of corporate profits being up 12% next year. And even now I'm seeing higher expectations of the Fed cutting rates. Uh, I think there's a 25% expectation in, in March and 60% in May. And I just don't see that. I, I think the Fed, um, you know, last uh, dot plot had uh, predicted uh, two cuts in 2024. And that you know, the earliest cut coming in the summer, and I, I really don't expect any cuts coming un, until the summer because yes, we have made a lot of progress in inflation, but core inflation is still at four percent, more than double the Fed's target of two percent. So I think the Fed's going to keep these restrictive rates um, still uh, and and hold it higher for longer, just as they've told us. So I think um, I think there's just a lot of uh, some investors are getting ahead of themselves uh, with this recent rally. So that implies that maybe we're going to see stocks sell off at some point, right, Eric? I mean, I know it's tough to time the market here, but going into the new year, do you want to be defensive and if you're potent potentially looking for that sell-off? I don't necessarily call for a sell-off, but I think we're going to be uh, cap-bound. Um, and I think we're at the upper cap right now, probably between you know, 4,300 and, and, and 4,600 because the valuations had, had gotten a lot more attractive on the large caps uh, towards the end of October, where they, had, because of that market correction, had fallen back down to their 25-year average. But this recent rally erased that correction. So now we're still seeing S&P 500 uh, valuations, the PEs, um, nearing 20. So I think we're just capped out right now. Um, and even we're seeing uh, in, in the third quarter earnings reports, many companies have started to um, uh, decrease their uh, earnings per share estimates. We, in fact, we saw earnings per share estimates in the first month for October uh, drop 3.9%, which is more than double the drop over the past 10 years. So I think we're hearing companies express this caution, and that's just something investors should keep in mind. Yes, a lot of good news in the market. I'm, I, I would cla call myself a cautious bull because I think we've made a lot of progress, but I just don't think we're out of the woods yet. And so, Eric, uh, not out of the woods yet, but in the equity market right now, given that backdrop, uh, when you're screening for opportunities, Eric, what are you screening for exactly? Well, I really want to focus on quality companies, companies that have solid balance sheets, solid cash flows that aren't going to be as so dependent upon lending. Uh, I also like dividend paying stocks or dividend paying funds. I mean, over the past 30 years, uh, dividend paying stocks have outperformed the S&P 500 when the 10 year treasury is between four and 6%. And that's the environment we're in. So I think that's really what investors should focus on those quality oriented companies and valuation matters. Gr the growth stocks have really outperformed value stocks this year. So now I think it is important to look on those value stocks 
um, the PEs a lot more uh, affordable um, and, and less expensive than some of these growth stocks. And that's something investors should keep in mind as the economy does slow down going into 2024. Eric, thanks a lot. Eric Sterner, Apollon Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And turning now to some of today's trending tickers. First, we're taking a look at shares of iRobot. They are taking a hit. Stocks under pressure here as the fate of its $1.4 billion deal with Amazon hangs in the balance. So here was the, the headline, Joyce. The European Commission, they have questions. Yes. Yeah, they have concerns. <laughs> they have issued what is known over there as a, as a statement of objections. And basically saying, one, Amazon's deal could negatively impact the market for making and supplying these robot vacuum cleaners, and two, could strengthening its role in the online marketplace. iRobot, as you can see, they're really getting hit hard in today's trades. It was the biggest intraday drop, by the way, in years on that headline. I, I kind of love the statement of objections. Yes. It's a little bit like the airing of grievances, <laughs> the statement of ob objections here. What's interesting, there's a couple of interesting things about this. First of all, this is in contrast with the British approval of the deal right. here. So right. now you got a little bit of a conundrum where one of the regulatory agencies has these concerns that now Amazon has to come back or the two parties have to come back and address. This deal was announced back on August 5th of 2022. So this has been a long running situation that Amazon is waiting to get approved. It's a $1.3 billion deal. And by the way, those iRobot shares have fallen more than 40% in that period. So that doesn't seem to reflect a lot of optimism that the deal is indeed going to close. Yeah, I think maybe some of this too, as we saw a recent Reuters piece that suggested it was gonna, it was gonna close, there wasn't gonna be an issue. So maybe this is just some mm. investors getting caught off guards. The date on the calendar though is February 14th. That is when the commission apparently is gonna choose whether to approve the deal with concessions or block it. That's very romantic, uh, Valentine's <laughs> Day. Uh, let's talk about Crown Castle too, because that uh, company is facing revived pressure from activist investor Elliott Management to make executive and board changes. Crown, uh, by the way, Crown Castle issued a statement in response saying it is open to commencing a constructive engagement with Elliott. Uh, those Crown, Crown Castle shares are moving higher today. Um, this is a wireless tower operator. It leases out. It's actually a REIT, a real estate investment trust, and it leases out its towers to the um, wireless phone providers, the Verizons and the AT&Ts of the world here. It's down year to date. We've seen a lot of pain in the REITs, um, so it's not unusual in that sense. Uh, but Elliott says the stock price is near six-year lows and the underperformance that they looked at back in 2020 has only worsened. That's according to Elliott Managing Partner, uh, Jesse Cohen. Yeah, so this is you know, Paul Singer making moves. This mm -hmm. is uh, his from Elliott Management, and they want to see changes. They disclosed this $2 billion stake. They want new management. They want new board leadership. They want to review the fiber business. That's just among other issues. Saying they're going to nominate new directors to the majority of positions on Crown Castle's board. And Elliott emphasized the stock price, as you noted, really near multi-year lows here. Mm -hmm. Said current leadership of the company has, quote, destroyed billions of dollars in value to its capital allocation decisions. And of course, this is what Elliott does and does very effectively for a long time. Gets a stake, rattles some cages, mm -hmm. makes some changes. Yeah, we'll see if the changes work. Just looking year to date, American Tower which is probably the closest competitor, Crown yep. Castle, down about 4%. Right. Crown Castle down about 20%. Yeah, rough. And finally here, Domino's Pizza getting a bullish call from TD Cowan, the firm raising its price target on the stock, citing optimism on the company's U.S. turnaround. So they like what they see here, Julie. They go, their target goes um, to 4.30, it looks like, from 4.10. Say they are bullish on the company's U.S. turnaround. A date on your calendar, they mark, would be December 7th. Mm -hmm. That is Domino's Investor Day, they know. Analysts saying that could be a turning point marking this, what they see, acceleration in U.S. comparable sales. Yeah, interesting here um, that they're looking at that date. And they also talk about the launch of Uber Eats at the end of this year for Domino's. Remember, there had been, like, years of sort of reluctance to partner, right, with uh, some of the companies like that, although I'm not sure from which end the reluctance was coming. Yep. But in any case, um, they talk about some measures that the company will be taking in concert with that Uber Eats launch as being positive for the company. And they're looking at 5% uh, comps um, and 5% 5, 5 comps for 24 and 25 for the company as a result of all of these measures. So we'll yeah. see. Hyman's a big fan of Domino's? No. No, really? No. Uh, I've covered for, for a long time watchers of Yahoo Finance. 
Yeah. Anyone living in the greater New York City area, mm -hmm. and I include New Jersey in that, which has excellent pizza. It really does. There is no reason <laughs> to order from a Domino's, my friends. Too many local pizzas. The local yeah. pizza places are great. I no, so I just. They're... I like Domino's, but I'm with you. The problem is that we got the family owned local pizzeria. Yeah. And then you feel like you're being disloyal that. when you go on the I don't know, I can't do it. It doesn't even occur to me, no. honestly. <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right. We are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, Octa shares under pressure on a downgrade. We have the analysts behind that call, and it comes just ahead of the company's earnings on Wednesday. And beyond holiday shopping, investors are increasingly focused on the new year. 2024 is getting a lot of bullish stock market forecasts from strategists, but based on past calls, how seriously can we take these opinions? We're going to discuss that on the other side of this break. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with a ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Cyber Monday sales are expected to top $12 billion, driven by discount seekers. It's coming as U.S. consumers set a record for Black Friday in online sales. That's according to Adobe Analytics. For more on the how the holiday shopping season is shaping up, we have Jill Standish, Accenture Global Retail Lead. So, Jill, it is great to have you. You're the perfect person to talk to about this. Let's talk, Jill, just first of all about the holiday shopping season. You've got Cyber Monday. Of course, we're going to be rolling into Christmas here. What are you expecting for this holiday shopping season, Jill? You know, same as last year, stronger, weaker? What do you think? Well, I think we're all watching the numbers really strongly, aren't we? Uh, and the reason is, is because this season actually started later than in previous years. Um, a lot of our research showed that people weren't going to start shopping until after Thanksgiving. And sure, that happened on Black Friday. Um, any prediction? Uh, I'd say anywhere between two, three, four percent up from last year for all of holiday. Um, we're seeing those kind of numbers. Let's see what happens today, though, because it is Cyber Monday. Well, and also, Jill, um, what struck me about the um, sort of holiday prediction survey you put out, I guess it, it was in advance of this, was that people are planning to cut back in a lot of different ways. They're planning to cut back on non-essentials. They're planning to cut back on gifts for extended family and friends because of budget constraints. When do we find out if they've actually done that? Because as we know, what people say they're going to do and what they actually do doesn't always yeah. match up. Yeah, the, the old say do gap, of course. Um, well, listen, this is the golden quarter, um, I like to call it. Um, I don't know if you know what Black Friday really means. It's actually when a lot of companies turn from being in the red to being in the black, and that in terms of profit. Um, so, I mean, we, we did see this coming. We did see, um, especially from changes in from last year to this year, that people said only 26% said they were going to start early. So that's really low. So it, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Um, again, we're, we're still in the shopping season. It is Cyber Monday. It was Small Business Saturday. And, and we are seeing a, a nice uptick. The other thing that really helped on Friday, if you're in the Northeast, is that the weather was nice. So we didn't have any storms keeping people out from trying to shop. And Jill, you know, given that this is a more kind of uncertain backdrop here, macro backdrop, do you all see retailers responding? Um, are they behaving or adjusting this holiday season in any way versus, let's say, last year? Yeah, I mean, there was. We also studied um, the retail executive population as well, and what we found was that a vast majority of them were looking at inventory levels, so they were going to cut back on inventory. They were also watching staffing levels and watching profit margins. So. This is a they're running a business here, of course. And so making sure that as they looked at the projected holiday, they were using analytics as much as possible to say, what is the right price? When should we start our promotions and what kind of labor do we need to make sure that we're not dipping into that poor experience that people notice when they go into stores? So it's all playing into um, a profit watch for this year. Absolutely. Um, Jill, a lot has been made this year uh, that people are buying less stuff and spending that money on doing things. Are we also going to see a movement for the holiday, and this has been talked about in recent years, of people buying experiences for their loved ones instead of stuff, you know, physical gifts? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of our survey talked about over half said that they were going to stop buying for um, for adults and really just focus on the kids. So I think we're still going to see that happening around toys for kids. Um, but we also see a big uptick in focusing on time with family. I always like to say this is going to be a real human holiday, which means probably a lot of travel. We saw a ton of travel over the last um, holiday for Thanksgiving. We'll probably see similar for Christmas. Um, and so people are looking at um, spending time with their family and probably the retailers that are, are going to have a lot of uptick are going to be those focusing on the meal. Um, so hopefully that'll also be something that we watch is people spending money on entertaining at home. Um, if you think about it, it's a couple of years ago, we weren't able to do that. So this year we're saying it's going to be a real human holiday. And Joe, you, you know, the report, you focus a lot on what people are buying this holiday shopping season. What about gifting, Joe? Um, obviously that's an important trend too. Any interesting themes or trends you spotted there as you surveyed pe folks? Yeah, um, well, it's, again, I talked about the fact that people are not giving to close family and friends and they're going to focus on the kids. Um, we also saw that a very small percentage of folks were going to be self-gifting. I don't know about you, when I go shopping, sometimes I buy something for my family, but then I buy something for myself. So gifting is really down. 
Um, we also saw that there was a real focus on gifts that are going to last. Um, so the board games, those things that it's not just a one and done that actually you can bring out every year. Um, we also saw some cutbacks on extravagant things like um, watching the budget. I mean, everyone's talking about budget conscious consumer today and very, being very pragmatic about what they're spending money on. So less decorative lights, looking at the, the bill for the elect, electric bill, for example. So I think you're going to see a very pragmatic holiday by the consumer because they're watching a budget. Yeah, although I'm always surprised anew every single year that like the day after Thanksgiving when I'm driving back home that people's lights are already up. Um, Jill, one final question for you, because I know you guys have looked at the issue of cybersecurity as well and surveyed um, clients about that. Is that something that customers need to be worried about when they're doing all of their online shopping? Or, you know, it doesn't feel like it's a it's something that that companies ever entirely get their arms around. But how are they doing right now? Yeah, I mean, in our survey, actually, 93% of CEOs talked about the importance of cybersecurity and acknowledge it that it's a key part of their business. And so the good news is, is there's a lot of technology that can help there. And most retailers have invested to make sure that it's safe. And, you know, you don't hear about the data breaches like we did in the past. So that's the good news. Um, I, I also want to bring up, it's not just about cyber. There's also a lot of organized retail crime going on in stores. And so seeing how retailers are focusing on technology that can help alert law enforcement, that can help monitor stores, et cetera, and having store employees actually do some of the reporting of that is, is also really important because we saw a lot of uptick, especially in major cities around organized retail crime. I'm hoping that some of the technology is a deterrent um, and we're watching that very closely this season. Um, but again, that's that's something that we continually watch. And the good news is, is that um, so far anyway, I haven't seen a lot that's happened over the weekend. Let's see what happens next. All right, we'll be watching. Jill Standish, thank you so much, Jill, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Also, of course, related as we watch all these numbers on this Cyber Monday, Amazon, the new king of the parcel delivery giants, knocking UPS and FedEx out of the running. That's according to company documents seen by the Wall Street Journal. The e-commerce giant had already delivered 4.8 billion packages by Thanksgiving this year and projects it'll do another billion by year end. Here with more on this is Scott Devitt, Equity Research Managing Director at Wedbush. Scott, it's great to see you. I hope you had a great holiday um, and that you're doing a lot of buying <laughs> right now. <laughs> you know, I, I'm so curious about this sort of uh, battle, if you will, for package volume. It's something that UPS and FedEx seem to have stepped back on, at least the volume race. Is winning winning in this case? In other words, is it better for Amazon to be doing all this volume itself? Well, happy holidays. And um, it's always easy for a competitor that's losing to say that they're not going after sure. market share. So um, that's somewhat comical. But what's happened over the, the past many years has been that Amazon's taken share of delivery because it's providing packages delivered from itself and also the very large network of merchants that are um, on its marketplace. And so where Amazon's taking significant shares or taking volume away from UPS and FedEx that would have been delivered by either of those companies under scenarios at which those merchants actually weren't selling on the Amazon marketplace. And the way that Amazon has been able to do that is because they've increased their own last mile delivery. So they have a full logistics capability within the business. So the way that the market share has changed is that more merchandise that's retail oriented that's coming out of Amazon fulfillment centers is making up in the incremental market share gains that Amazon's um, getting from the other two providers. And Amazon's not in the business of picking up packages and delivering you know, which I think is market share that's probably safe for UPS and FedEx, but as it rates to retail, you know, um, Amazon's built a better mousetrap. And Scott, for Amazon investors who are listening to this right now, why should they care, Scott? Why should they pay attention to this headline? Well, what's part of the mode of Amazon is the, the logistics capability that the company has. It's differentiated relative to other retailers. And um, it's part of what allows the company to gain and grow market share. And so the relevance of it is it's incredibly expensive to build the network that Amazon has. But now that it's in place, it's uh, it's unmatched, unparalleled, and unable to be um, replaced by any competition. So the benefit that Amazon has is the experience they provide to the customer, 
which is why consumers go to amazon.com. And because of that, that brings third-party merchants onto the marketplace and Amazon can deliver products faster than any other provider, which is exactly what a consumer prefers on the internet. And one last other data point that I provide is now, you know, as Amazon has increased the regional aspects of its business in the United States post pandemic, now in the largest 60 metro markets, over 50% of the packages are being delivered same day or next day, which is gonna further the advantage this holiday season with the holiday being on a Monday, um, and in just in general as well, taking share of consumer products categories that are um, more near term in nature in terms of the consumer's preference to pick them up at a Walgreens or et cetera. Um, it's so interesting to me also, I mean, that's interesting that market share number is pretty incredible, but because of Amazon's relationship with its customers, it also has more levers, you could argue. It, for example, I'm not communicating with UPS and choosing if I want to get my packages in a fewer boxes on a given day, right? Like Amazon gives customers that kind of flexibility and has that kind of dialogue, if you will, with customers. So is that data and is that flexibility also something that, that Amazon can use to its advantage? Well, I think, I think the advantage is in having the most trusted marketplace in the, if we're using the US example in the country for getting purchases delivered to directly to the consumer's door. And that opens up all kinds of opportunities. It draws merchants into the marketplace because that's where the volume is. And when you have this logistics network bolted in with, as you mentioned, you know, the example that you gave, you can also defer your shipment and get credits from Amazon video and other things on Amazon as well. There's all kinds of things that would never be able to be done by a third party provider that Amazon's now integrated into its system. So um, there's no going back there, and there's no really reversing this advantage that Amazon's gotten. And it's why it's such a powerful player in retail right now. I would even compare that or contrast it to you know, Walmart, which has uh, the capabilities to get products to the consumer very quickly, but they're not, um, one, they're not in the in, in the mind of the consumer as it relates to direct distribution as much as Amazon. And two, I don't think they're as flexible or as innovative in terms of the initiatives that they have in place, which is why Amazon continues to take online share outside of grocery as well. And Scott, more broadly, you know, you look at Amazon here, it's up nearly 80% this year, Scott. You've got the equivalent of a buy on the name. What are the potential catalysts ahead for Amazon? It's still not an expensive stock. So the, the catalyst ahead is significant margin expansion, which has only just begun. The company built out excess capacity due to the pandemic. So it wasn't excess during the peak of the pandemic, but as the pandemic ended, it became excess. It wasn't the fault of the company. It was just the nature of we were going through a once in a, in a generation experience and it had to adapt to that. Now the company is building back into those fulfillment centers. So uh, capacity utilization is improving and margins are beginning to rise. And it's probably the beginning of a two year cycle of significant increases in margin expansion. When we look out a few years, um, you look four years forward, this company is going to be doing north of 100 billion in free cash flow, and the following year, 120 billion in free cash flow. So when you start thinking about multiples, um, it's a very inexpensive to stock if the company can execute on that margin expansion, which we're confident it will be. I think in, in the next three to four years, you know, this stock is a $250 stock. Scott Devitt, great to see you as always. Thanks for your time today. Thanks so much. Coming up, a case for new highs in 2024. Many market bulls don't believe a recession in 2024 would derail stocks for the year. We're gonna tell you why on the other side of the break. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard 
landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester, Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. November 10th to be bullish for the market, and stocks are coming off their fourth straight weeks of week of gains. The question now is whether this rally has staying power headed into the new year. Jared Blickery here with the details and maybe some charts for us to tell us if that's going to happen. I got charts, Julie. Just watch here. They're going to come <laughs> up. But let me show you this heat map first, which is disappearing. There we go. Tech, that's XLK, up 12.7% uh, in November. This has been a blockbuster month, kind of a continuation of the early part of the year rally that just lost its footing for a few months. Uh, into July, we were sitting on top of gains, 20 30%, depending on the index. Uh, very uh, sizable. Now, number two is consumer discretionary. Number three is real estate, then we have communication services, then financials. But my point is the mega cap sectors, which take up XLK, XLY, and XLC, 
those are vastly overrepresented once again. Before I move on, I just want to show you how sentiment has gotten stretched in favor of the bulls. This is the AAII bull bear spread. So this is you take the number of bulls, you subtract the number of bears, and you get a difference of the two. It has been screaming higher. This is one of the fastest moves higher we've seen in quite some time. And you might be saying, well, what if it gets too high? Are there too many bulls? We are not at that stage just yet. But yes, when this gets a little bit too stretched, then you're thinking contrarian trades. Then you're thinking, all right, I want to really, I want to get out of some of these issues. I want to take some profits. But just thinking uh, about this into the new year, uh, when we have this outside of performance, the logical question would be, what happens the next year? And in fact, BMO has done a study. Whenever we have a lot of relative outperformance, and that's relative is key. I'll explain that in a second. The following year tends to see gains of 14.3%. That's an average. We saw this happen in 92, 98, 2001, 2009, 13, 19, and 2021. Be easy to forget that 2020 was a year of huge mega cap outperformance. Uh, very, very hinky year for a lot of different reasons, uh, the pandemic and whatnot. But that was very recent. You go back to 2019, 2018 was a year of outsized gains, not necessarily in all the things on the MAG-7 we're talking about today, but nevertheless big gains. 2001 was the only year where we had huge outperformance, and then we saw big losses the next year. So take this with a grain of salt, and I guess the biggest point I'm trying to hammer home is things evolve from year to year. Uh, just take a look at this. I showed this a little bit earlier in the day, but this is one year ago. This shows that strategists were negative on 2023 returns, and of course we know the opposite it is to be true. Um, it just tends to be that forecasting looks at the present, extrapolates in a linear fashion, and there you go. But things are going to look a lot differently on January 1st. So enjoy the rally while it comes this year. And enjoy the mega cap rally while it's here. Uh, but things are probably going to change next year. Oh, thanks a lot, Jared, <laughs> for the happy for. news. Appreciate it. And next year will be a stock picker's paradise, and the S&P 500 will grow to record levels. It's going to Bank of America. That equity strategy team expects another strong year, with the index reaching 5,000 by the end of 2024. That would be a 10% pop on current levels, and Josh Schaefer has been speaking with them about that bullish outlook. Josh. Yeah, Josh. So one thing I was curious, so Bank of America had their roundtable that goes with their 2024 outlook today. And one thing I was curious about going into it is just the bulls feel a little bit more bullish right now than they were maybe last year. If you start thinking about some of these calls out there, Bank of America out calling for 5,000. We know BMO out this morning saying 51,000. Deutsche Bank saying 51,000 for the S&P 500. We're talking, you know, 10 or 11 percent gains versus last year. Someone like Savita Subramanian at Bank of America, who's traditionally bullish, really only seeing 6% upside in the benchmark, right? So what's the difference? That was my question is, all right, you were still relatively positive last year. Now we're positive and we're seeing a bigger upside. And Savita hit on a couple things when I asked that question that I found interesting. She called it, quote, proof of concept. We've seen proof of concept from some of the things we were worried about coming into 2023. Go all the way back to January. We were talking about the year of efficiency, right, in tech. Are these companies going to become more efficient? How are they going to restructure themselves? You look at a company like Meta, they passed that test, right, for a lot of the street, and that's why you see the Magnificent Seven leading the way they did. They doubled their margins in the previous quarter from where they were last year. They sort of said, you know, we can handle this operating environment, and that's made Bank of America more comfortable overall on where we're headed. Another thing she pointed out that's always interesting, too, to think about is just the S&P 500's own restructuring that happens, right? And the companies that leave the S&P 500, sort of some of those weaker parts of the benchmark coming out. You take a look at a Dish Network got kicked out of the S&P 500. That stock's down 70% this year. It's nice to get some of the bottom out mm. when you in companies that are considered, whether they're considered interest rate sensitive or just the market saying they are, you can look at those year-to-day performances of three stocks that got booted from the benchmark, but they feel like the S&P now is in a better position headed into this year, a little bit more ready for this environment. Now, to be clear, these forecasts are frequently wrong, mm -hmm. right? But maybe, you know, I, the, over the years, I've come to think of them not so much as, is the S&P 500 going to finish the year at 5,000 or 5,100, and more as, as you've sort of framed it, like a vibe check, right, yeah. of how these strategies are feeling 
And there is this, you know, sort of cautious optimism, I guess, going into next year. Is that the way to characterize it? I, I think so, because the other thing I'm picking up on, too, is whether you're in the recession camp or not in the recession camp. Bank of America doesn't think we're going to see a recession, but you look at two other notes that we already re referenced that were out today with BMO and Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank sees a recession next year. They just basically said, yeah, we've been talking about the recession for a year. So it's price right. down. So it's fine. Mm. And sort of, I think that's an interesting quote unquote vibe check that we're getting on 24 too, is maybe the recession does come, but it just doesn't feel like when we were talking about the recession rest. Well, right? or if you get the recession accompanied by rate cuts, mm -hmm. that also can help uh, with a stock rally, maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Some would argue. Your piece, when it, was it a Belsky from BMO called the chicken little recession? Did yeah. I see that? Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Nice. That's, I mean, that's a top tier quote. Chicken <laughs> little recession is great. <laughs> Josh, thanks so much, yeah. appreciate it. All right, and coming up, Okta shares feeling some pressure this afternoon after JMP Securities downgraded that stock to market perform. We're we'll going to talk to the analysts behind that call on the other side of this break. The call of the day here on Yahoo Finance, Okta hit with a downgrade by Citizens JMP Securities. The analysts warning that the company is facing significant brand degradation in the wake of its latest security breach. Joining us now is Citizens JMP Securities equity research analyst Trevor Walsh. Walsh uh, Trevor, good to see you. Some really eye-opening stuff in your note on Okta. You basically surveyed some of its customers to try to find out how they were feeling 
And they had some pretty dramatic things to say about the company's brand equity right now. What kind of stood out to you the most in terms of the commentary you got? Yeah, thanks. Uh, good to be with you. I, I, I think probably one of the most pressing or uh, um, things that caught us, I think, most by, not necessarily surprised, but seemed the most um, significant in our conversations was not so much immediate churn risk, but more so, as you mentioned, the overall um, just perception of the brand um, in, in light of the recent incident, and then kind of bolted on top of that, uh, a, a, hesitancy, a hesitancy to expand or, or add on to the platform, even with, even when a customer was not planning necessarily churn Okta or, or um, you know, deprecate them from their environment. And Trevor, so, so this color and commentary you got from customers is important. Um, when you talk about the, the kind of impact this breach could have to the overall business though, Trevor, is it possible to try and quantify that in some way? Yeah, it's it, it, breaches are always uh, difficult to quantify from a, from a lot of different angles. Whether you're an organization that's trying to understand what the risk of a breach is to either your brand, like in this case, or even just to top line kind of revenues. Um, as far as what Okta reported uh, and what we have kind of to date in terms of the details, about one percent of its customers were ultimately uh, ultimately affected in terms of what the attacker was uh, able to get access to. We don't necessarily have a sense as to whether or not the attacker was able to pick and choose that 1% of customers, but our assessment now is that it was kind of a random set of customers based on the specific support system that the that the attacker was able to gain access to. Um, but, but either way, um, you trust is important in security. So whenever you've got any group of customers being affected by something like this, it causes pause um, within the larger install base. And that's definitely something that we saw kind of coming out of our discussions with the customers that we spoke to with. Trevor, Okta reports after the close of trading on Wednesday. What do you think is the most important question for the company's management right now, given you know the findings um, from your survey and given the breach? Yeah, I think we sort of looked at this kind of twofold. One was just the response to the breach itself. Um, and again, this is unfortunately kind of the second of uh, recent incidents involving Okta in terms of uh, some sort of security breach, either within their environment or maybe just on the periphery with a partner. Um, so I think one one thing that we found fairly striking from just our review of Okta's own telling of the timeline, as well as its own customers that were publicly acknowledged, other security vendors, in fact, was just the length of time that it took to kind of get a handle on what was actually happening. Um, we're talking, when we hear from other vendors within our security coverage, we're talking about trying to get the mean time to response to engines down to hours, not days. And, and this took several weeks just to get kind of a general answer. So would like to hear a little bit more as to um, what you know what what happened and why it was so difficult to just get an initial assessment. Um, we don't want to obviously kind of Monday morning quarterback that. It's easy to kind of hear or review things in hindsight, but I think that's definitely one issue that we'd like to understand. And I think customers again that we spoke to had similar sentiments that they shared. And then just secondarily is kind of what what is the appetite or the I guess maybe the uh, the outlook for management to start sharing some uh, more metrics around um, other modules or addition additional markets they're going after, or whether that be the privilege access space, um, which is going to be the more recent uh, add-on as far as modules or new products, and then as well as the identity governance space as well, which, which is where um, they've been for a couple quarters now. Just getting a little bit more concrete understanding from management in terms of what is the actual attach rate or growth rate or just something that we can get our hands around in terms of where these new products are performing and what we can expect them to do in the future. And Trevor, I want to get you out of here on this, talking about competition, because Okta does have it. You know, you look at Microsoft, uh, for example, first and foremost. When you talk about this breach, does that change the competitive landscape at all, Trevor? Do you think that gives Microsoft, uh, you know, a line of sight here, opportunity to capitalize on that, maybe take some business? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, Microsoft is not a competitor to be taken lightly, and uh, we've we've that's always been a theme for Okta. Why it didn't necessarily bother us before, or we weren't necessarily as concerned about it, was because they do have differentiating kind of capabilities and um, just technical know-how around the platform that they've historically relied upon. Um, and that's maybe kept Microsoft at bay. But when you start adding on these additional uh, kind of you know, laps, laps in execution or judgment or whatever it might be that are leading to these types of incidents, 
that just becomes, I think, a cross that's too hard to bear um, for customers um, and definitely can, cr opens up the door for Microsoft where there wasn't maybe conversations happening before. Uh, those are starting to happen now. And, and certainly in this environment where the macro picture is creating uh, constraints around budget and CFOs trying to kind of gain uh, get cost savings wherever they can. Um, that definitely, again, is a theme that we heard uh, in our checks as we were talking with customers in this latest go around around the incident, that that's happening kind of regardless of, of what happens on the security front. So as we said in our note, there's very, there's little room for Okta with respect to, for error with respect to Okta and Microsoft for sure. Trevor Walsh, thanks so much. Really appreciate your perspective on all this. Thanks. Coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We'll check in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. Not long now for the market close. Let's take a look at some of the action, or I guess lack thereof, that we saw today, at least in the broader averages, right? Because here's the Dow Jones Industrial Average, pretty tight range throughout the day, finishing down just about two tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ, which had been flirting with gains for a lot of the session, now down. But I mean, this is a very narrow range we're talking about. Yeah. It definitely feels like, you know, after Thanksgiving, easing back into the week, perhaps. I yeah, don't know. taking a little easy, not doing a whole lot here. Not doing a whole lot. So let's get on over to the trending tickers because there we see more action uh, in what's going on and people looking up the stuff that's associated with Cyber Monday. I'm seeing a lot of that today. We talked a little bit about Shopify at the top of the show, the fact that it's at its highest, I believe, in about 18 months. This is a three year chart that we're looking looking at, but Shopify has been really seen as one of the winners here, um, at least one of the early winners 
of this holiday shopping season. We are also talking about another winner, that the trend that Adobe picked out there, Buy Now, Pay Later, yes. looking at some of those names, right? Also a winner so far. Yeah, this Affirm chart, not quite as good, you know, good looking here. It's still tr not trading at its highest in, in quite a while, but it is, I believe, at least at a 52 week high here for those Affirm shares. They've come back a little bit. Amazon is on the trending list as well. It's just up about three quarters of 1% today, but as Scott Devitt talked about, it's had a big year and he still thinks the valuation looks attractive. And then I was just scrolling down to see if there are any others that kind of pop up here. Uh, Zscaler is one that does stand out to me, and that's because the company reports its earnings yep. after the close of trading. We'll get some enterprise computing and software um, and services kind of measure here. Then we got Okta later in the week. So we're going to begin to hear from some of those companies. And don't forget about Domino's right there, too. Yeah, getting that upgrade Your favorite earlier pizza today. Place. So finishing, my favorite, finishing higher by about four and a half percent. Hey, there's a place for Domino's. In every, uh, I think I, so. Even yeah. I can acknowledge that. A younger Josh Lipton loved Domino's. I'm sure. Well, there you have the closing bell ringing on the NYSC here today on this Monday following the Thanksgiving holiday and what a lot of folks refer to as Cyber Monday to be followed by Giving Tuesday, as a lot of folks call that, too. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later in the show here. So if we look at some of the stats here, some of the closing stats that we are watching and some of the underlying moves, I mentioned earlier in the show, energy is the worst performing group today. Oil, WTI, now down for four days in a row. Um, Amazon up for three days in a row here, seeing that run that it's been on here as people really get into their holiday shopping in earnest here. And we're seeing some at least 52 week highs for some of those uh, large cap tech stocks as well. Also seeing a little bit more risk on, even though overall we're not seeing risk on, there are some indicators uh, as our Jared Blickery points out, um, are the ARK, ARK K, the ARK investment benchmark uh, ETF up three days in a row, IPO, that ETF up three days in a row, and NEEM up three days in a row. So there's a little bit of Risk a sprinkle nibbling. of risk. A sprinkle, yeah. I like that. All right, let's get a check on some trending tickers here. First off, shares of Teva closing higher today, about 3.5% there. UBS upgrading that stock to buy from neutral. They also take their target, Julie, from 11 to 13. And the story here is they say Teva is uniquely positioned to undergo a significant transition to a more brand-focused company. Teva, of course, a generic drug yes. maker, right? And so that can drive stock outperformance, they think. Stock right now isn't pricing that in, in their opinion. Uh, they're telling clients they're optimistic on a burgeoning brand pipeline that they think it can start to be realized via outcome in two key clinical trials second half of next year. Yeah, and they're taking the price target up to $13 on the back of all of this. Um, and, you know, there has been a biotech sell-off to some degree, so looking at it again because of this. But really, this is a big transition for Teva, um, obviously, from generics more towards branded products. And they're, um, this note talking about some of the key brands that the company has uh, that will, they think, do better than what consensus is pricing in for the company. So... We'll see if this ends up uh, sort of coming to fruition, if you will. Teva shares sort of meandered, I guess, for quite a long time. Um, and generics is a tough business because it is a more sort of commodified business. Of course, you could argue branded is can be a tough business because you're always facing generic competition down the road. But the five-year chart of Teva is pretty ugly here. The stock yeah. is down quite a lot. And up about 8% this year, but according to their new fans of UBS, not pricing and some good news ahead. Yeah, we'll see if it works out that way. We are also watching shares of EV maker Lucid closing lower today after Needham downgraded the stock to hold from buy. Needham analyst Chris Pierce cutting his rating on weak demand for the company's vehicles. Now, this was part of a bigger look at the EV landscape by Chris Pierce, where he looked not just at Lucid, he looked at Rivian, which is his favorite in the sector, by the way. He looked at Fisker, a stock that's also down sharply today, and he looked at Tesla. And really, um, Lucid is one of the ones that is um, suffering here because of the downgrade. Specifically, he lowered his unit estimates um, after the company came out with its numbers. Yeah, the analyst saying it doesn't have enough faith in near-term demand to drive unit volumes. By the way, this, this name is now down about 40% this year, and there are zero buys left on this stock. Yeah, he talks about that there is some brand enthusiasm driving demand, not just for Lucid, but also for Fisker and Rivian, but that these companies are um, demand constrained to varying degrees, that there is some demand there, but then there's a limit to the demand 
for example. So that's kind of an interesting perspective on it. Although he says that they like the tech. They like the tech. All right. Not everybody does, I guess. Nope. Mm -hmm. And finally, we're going to hear shares of TV platform Roku closing higher. About, about nearly 9% there. Mm -hmm. That's after Cannonball Research upgrading that stock from neutral to buy. So the money quote here, I think, uh, was they say they now believe that room for upside to 2024 consensus forecast, that's enough, they think, to allow for more meaningful upward estimate revisions. Mm -hmm. And they've seen in recent quarters, they say connected TV advertising, by the way, just more broadly, connected TV advertising spending is holding up better than feared. Big jump in their price target, dude. Mm -hmm. They go from 88 to 116. The stock's already up 150% or something year to date. Yep. So it has already done very well this year. Um, if you look again over the sort of longer term here, the stock is up about 240%. So you've really seen a comeback already in Roku. You always wonder when you see that, you know, and that's the two year chart. I guess everything depends on the time horizon. Um, you worry about the timing of a call like this after the stock has already gone up 150%. Yeah. But I guess if you're bullish, you're bullish. And you, and it, you can still keep going. And remember, earlier this month, they reported they beat, investors mm -hmm. piled in, but these guys obviously see more room for upside there. Yeah, looks that way. All right, moving on. Higher mortgage rates taking a toll on new home sales. Sales falling more than expected in October to an annualized rate of 679,000 and prices plunge as builders cut those prices. Joining us now is Resi Club co-founder and CEO Lance Lambert. Lance, it's great to see you. So new home sales, they fell by 5.6% Lance in October. That was a bit weaker than expected, it looks like. Give me your take on the report, Lance. What did you make of it? Yeah, so I, I think big picture, uh, home sales have kind of bounced off the bottom that occurred at the end of 2022, came up a little bit this year as the affordability adjustments builders made, kind of brought some build, some buyers into the market, given just how deteriorated affordability is in the resale market and the fact that, you know, existing homeowners just haven't moved down much on prices. And since then, we've seen some softening during the seasonally soft period of the year, uh, you know, the first half of the year is always seasonally the stronger window. The back half is always seasonally the weaker. And during this weaker period, in particular in October, mortgage rates had pushed up to 8%. They got an eight handle. And actually affordability accounting for incomes, prices, and mortgage rates, uh, affordability was at the worst levels in 40 years in October 2023. And since then, we've seen some improvement. Mortgage rates now have come back down around like 7.3%. And so the guess is that probably as we head into next year, as long as we don't retest that eight handle, and as we move into the seasonally stronger period of the year, that there will be some improvement again uh, when it comes in particular for the new home sales. So even if we get the improvement in sales, there was another story that caught our eye that uh, cited Redfin data that more people are, are selling their homes at a loss now for less than what they paid. Are we going to see that really start to go up as well as people maybe are forced to sell for various life reasons? Yeah, during the pandemic housing boom, it was really, really hard to sell at a loss, just given how fast house prices were moving up across the country. Uh, between March 2020 and like June 2022, uh, you saw house prices on a national level move up 45%. And then some markets like Boise and Austin, over 60% in just over two years. So it was really hard to sell for a loss during that window. But as rates have went up, there has been some pockets of the country where house prices have fallen, in, in particular in Texas, parts of Louisiana, some areas of the Mountain West. So in some of those areas, you know, people who bought at the peak and now if they're getting called back into the office, maybe they were in Boise and they have to go back to Seattle, some of them could sell at a loss. It's still a very, very tiny number, but you are seeing some of that. Uh, you aren't seeing much of it in the Northeast. Uh, you're not seeing much of it in the Midwest. And the reason being is that house prices there continue to move up at a steady pace uh, this year, despite mortgage rates uh, pushing up to 7%. And Lance, back to this, that new home sales report, I'm just interested. We often talk about these reports like it's one, one big number, but are there regional differences there in new home sales, Lance, to call out? Regional differences that are sort of interesting, you know, west midwest south that, that you would that you would highlight 
You know, when it comes to the housing market at large, the really interesting part right now is there's a lot of weakness in Texas, a lot of weakness in Louisiana. And those markets, they saw prices move up fairly fast during the pandemic, but they've also been hit by insurance shocks. Home insurance is moving up fairly fast in Texas and Louisiana. And those pockets also had some supply, in particular, like Travis County, Austin, Texas, uh, San Antonio, a, a lot of Texas, and then around uh, the Dallas area as well. You've just seen some weakening because there is some supply. And so some of the buyers in those markets have a bit of an edge um, and can kind of negotiate. Uh, whereas in the Northeast, if you're shopping in Connecticut, inventory active listings on Realtor.com between October 2019 and October 2023 are down 80%. So think about that for a second. That means for every four homes for sale in a place like Hartford, Connecticut, there's now just one home for sale. So sellers in those parts of the country where inventory is still very, very low, they just have an edge over buyers. Well, either that or all of us should move to Texas and what was the other one? Louisiana, I guess, or, or yeah. Mississippi, um, down to the south. Um, so, so Lance, and you mentioned that part of the dynamic here is the people getting called back to the office, right? Is there demand, though, for the houses that they're selling that might be a little bit further out? Yeah, I, I think it's on a case by case basis, and there's a tremendous amount of regional bifurcation in the country. And so you are still seeing some of that work from home arbitrage happen in the country, uh, but you're seeing it more of an exurbs, right? Like, so people aren't necessarily buying in Boise, completely relocating now. And instead, they're kind of looking further out into the suburbs and finding homes that, hey, maybe I could commute two days from this home. And so just a lot of regional uh, bifurcation right now is happening in the housing market. And, you know, a part of it is just how fast prices have moved up, how fast rates have moved up. And the fact that in some parts of the country, demand is pulled back faster than supply. And then in other parts, supply is pulled back faster than demand. Lance Lambert, thank you as always for joining us, Lance. That was great. Appreciate it. Being a public company in today's market certainly has a huge advantage, but there are some downsides too. We're gonna to hear from one CEO on what he's learned taking a company public and what investors can expect from the IPO market in the new year. That's next. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this and we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
As Congress returns from Thanksgiving recess this week, the debate over aid for Ukraine and Israel returns to the table. Yahoo Finance's senior columnist Rick Newman is here to break down the potential ripple effects awaiting the U.S. Rick. Hey, guys. We have not been hearing so much from Ukraine with uh, the Israeli war against Hamas and worries about a broader Middle East war obviously dominating the headlines. But things are not going great in Ukraine uh, and we're seeing, you know, part of the evidence of that is that Congress seems stuck on whether to uh, provide more aid for Ukraine. And now we have isolationist uh, Republicans in charge of the House Re of Representatives. Maybe they will uh, provide more aid for, they, for Ukraine and maybe they won't. President Biden wants another $64 billion, but um, so far that has not been forthcoming. And if there is any more money forthcoming, it probably won't be that much. So in the meanwhile, uh, what people may have missed as the Ru Russia is really getting off the mat here, um, they have um, really been able to stop Ukraine from making any progress at all in this offensive that began over the summer and basically has wound down. I mean, I think the basic storyline here is that all the Western equipment the United States and Europe provided, tons of tanks, tons of armor, it just came too late. Um, Russia had six to 12 months to build these defenses in place uh, and it turns out Ukraine was just not able to get through those. And now Russia's uh, Russia's whole economy is basically mobilizing for war. Uh, the amount that, that they're spending on defense and national security is rising from 4% of GDP to 10% of GDP. And here in the West, we're now starting to wring our hands and say, is this all worth it? So Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, his big gamble here is that the West is just going to lose interest and I'm sorry to say that there does seem a chance that he could turn out to be right about that. Are there um, elements in Congress who are, you know, going to be successful or who are strongly pushing for that aid, Rick? I mean, the, the, this is kind of an infuriating situation in Congress because uh, there are majorities when you put both parties together. Uh, there are bipartisan majorities in both the Senate and the House uh, that say, yes, they do favor more aid for Ukraine. Maybe not necessarily that whole $64 billion Biden is asking for, but Biden, I think Biden asked for more than he expected to get. But that was sort of his opening bid. Um, but, you know, Mike Johnson now represents the uh, sort of super conservative, uh, sort of isolationist, ultra-nationalist wing of the Republican Party, and, that, and that's where we're stuck. Um, so maybe this aid will go through, but you know, we're seeing similar problems in Europe. I mean, Europe, um, Europe has, has uh, it's been trouble, it's been difficult to motivate public support for uh, the biggest, the most important weapon Ukraine says it needs. I mean, they still don't have fighter jets that are still considered um, too risky to give them because whatever a backlash might come out of Russia, they barely have any of these long range missiles. The United States gave them some of these. I think there were two strikes with these long range missiles basically it looks like that was just as symbolic. So, um, I mean, the big picture here, guys, is this war is going to go on for a long time. Uh, and Russia's not giving up. Um, you know, 300,000 casualties, whatever the number is in Russia, it's huge. Uh, and this has not undermined uh, Putin's ability to wage this war. Whereas here in the West, we're saying, oh, we're getting tired of this. It's inconvenient. We should be focusing more on the southwest border, which is uh, you know, that's a false dichotomy. We can do more thing, more than one thing at once. But uh, we need to um, stiffen our resolve here. Rick Newman, thank you as always for joining us, Rick. Bye, guys. Well, Elon Musk traveling to Israel, visiting a kibbutz destroyed by Hamas and meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The visit coming days after he, uh, after he endorsed an anti-Semitic post on X. And it comes as the company faces more financial blowback from that endorsement. Companies like Apple, Disney and IBM pulled their advertising on X. The New York Times estimating it has cost the company or could call, end up costing the company around $75 million in revenue through the end of the year because of all of those companies pulling their advertising. The company itself says $11 million in revenue is at risk. You know, the Times is citing some internal documents here, so there's a little bit of um, dispute over exactly how much money that we're talking about. But it does, you know, the marquee names that are reportedly exiting the platform, they've got to be hurting. Yeah, I mean, you know, when... When Musk, of course, bought Twitter, there were some concerns from some quarters what it was going to mean for the platform and users and marketers. So he, you know, obviously those calls only got louder. He brings in Linda Yaccarino, 
the idea being, well, you know, her expertise, her Rolodex would help here. But according to that New York Times piece you cited, Julie, I mean, they go, they say that, you know, according to their reporting, 200 ad units of companies, they talk about Airbnb and Amazon and Coca-Cola and Microsoft, according to the Times, many of which have halted or are considering pausing their ads mm -hmm. on the social network. So according to their reporting, this looks potentially broader than we first thought. Now, so Elon Musk effectively doing a damage control campaign. He is taking this seriously, clearly, because he flew to Israel to meet with Netanyahu, and he uh, he tweeted, uh, or he posted on X, actions speak louder than words. But I would argue that his words are actions. His platform, the size of his platform is such that if he is amplifying anti-Semitic speech, that is an act. That is a conscious act to choose to amplify that speech. It's not just like, watch what I do, not what I say. Mm -hmm. uh, they're one, when it comes to him and what he's posting on X, I would argue they're one and the same. Will advertisers change their minds after seeing him walk around and do what he's doing? Maybe, or maybe he'll have to do more to actually show that on the platform itself, he is not amplifying those kinds of words. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know Musk. I've never interviewed Musk. Um, I am confused sometimes by the decisions he makes as a guy, you know, that smart, that powerful, and that impactful. Um, and at the end of the day, though, a problem is brands have options. I mean, if you're a marketer, mm. you can go other places. There's from TikTok to LinkedIn, there's a lot of places you can put your money to work. I also wonder, you know, how effective Julie Twitter ads really are. Mm -hmm. I do wonder if they were if they were really effective, would all these brands be considering you know pausing the way they would be is, is another question I would have. It's a good question. Yeah. And I think there's some answers on both sides of that yeah. spectrum, right, that we've heard from. Well the IPO window slowly reopening this year with debuts from the likes of Instacart and Clavio sparking cautious optimism for future IPO activity. Meanwhile, just today Reddit reportedly holding talks with potential investors for an initial public offering next year. That's according to Bloomberg. It last talked about this in 2021, by the way. However, the road ahead for public listings does remain ambiguous amid macro headwinds. Here with a deep dive, Amplitude co-founder and CEO Spencer Skates. His company went public through a SPAC back in 2022. So Spencer, what would you tell these guys? Don't do it? <laughs> or, or, <laughs> or do, you know, do you think that they should take what looks like, in some cases, a risky decision to come public? So I actually, I don't recommend going public via SPAC. Uh, that's why we at Amplitude went public via a direct listing. Oh, we're me. able to share the story directly. Uh, we're subject to all the same scrutiny through a regular public listing process, except direct listing has a few advantages. Um, highly recommend going public. It's a very natural place to a company to end up once it gets past 100 million or more in revenue. And it forces another level of leadership and predictability as a business. I'm really glad that we went out back in 2021. We were the first company in the product tech space to do that, and that's given us huge advantages today. And Spencer, what, what were those advantages? You went public. What would you say the benefits were to your business? There's a few. The first is having a liquid currency with your stock that you can use to do a number of things. You can use to hire employees and executive. You can use to acquire other companies. Um, another one is it makes you much higher profile. There's a lot of companies that specifically choose Amplitude and to, to do business with us because we're the one company in the space that's public. And then the last thing I'd say is it's it forces another level of leadership that you have to do where you have to talk about your plans and show predictability in the business over a long-term horizon. And so we have all of those today, whereas a lot of other companies in this space don't because they're not public. Um all of that said, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the, your stock has not performed great since that direct listing, um, if, you go, if you time it to that. So any regrets, any reservations, any lessons that you would share with others who are exploring this path? I think one of the mistakes that people made in 2021 is they looked at the growth rate of companies and projected it forward infinitely. Almost every single company that's gone through a public listing uh, in that time frame hasn't done well. And so I think one of the things that we did do well was being really clear that we're here to build a business for the long term and we're not focused on the performance of the stock in the short. 
And Spencer, as we look ahead at 2024, in terms of the IPO market, you see a lot of deals coming, Spencer? You know, I think this is one of the challenges where a lot of companies who didn't get out in that 2021 timeframe are having a much tougher time. Obviously, we saw Instacart and Klaviyo, and you guys just mentioned uh, Reddit as a potential another IPO. But I, th I think it's going to be much harder. Companies are going to have to get to much larger scale than that 100 million mark. Um, and so it's actually, frankly, from our standpoint, a good thing and a competitive advantage because we can be out there and we can leverage all the advantages of being a public company um, while a lot of our the competition in the rest of the space is blocked. Spencer, I, you know, I got to ask you, given what you guys do about the story we were just talking about, I'm calling a little bit of audible here because I know you're here to talk to us about public offerings, but we were just talking about X and a lot of brands pulling their uh, or at least pausing their campaigns on X. What you do is help brands figure out, for example, if their brand campaigns, if their advertising is effective. Can I, now you're the CEO of a public company, so I don't know if you can tell us this about your clients, but like, what are you seeing in terms of engagement on something like an X these days? I think what we're seeing is a switch from what I think of as third party and advertising data. So for example, using X or even Meta or Google as a platform, and instead thinking about ways to engage the customer base you already have with first party data. So what are ways that you can show them new offerings, uh, customize the experience better for them, um, or just make changes to the product to enhance the value that you already have, because it's much, much easier to engage with a set of customers you already have. It's about 10 times easier than to try to go acquire a new customer. And so I think we're going to continue to see a decline in general brand advertising and instead advertising that's more focused on targeted demographics, targeted users, uh, people that really resonate with a particular message. And so, Spencer, if I may then follow up, how does that communication occur? Does it happen through the direct channels that the brand has with its customers, email, text, what have you? Is that how it's going on? That's exactly right. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways uh, between phones, between websites, between emails, between new platforms like VR and AR. There's tons of ways that companies can now reach their end customers. And we've seen that. Clavio is a great example of that, where they're focused on if you had already some someone who signed up for your site and they haven't maybe checked out, how can you send them a message or a special offer to get them over that last hurdle? Um, and so I think we'll see a lot more of that generally versus generalized brand advertising like you see on X. It looks like you still have items in your cart. I've definitely gotten some of those emails, Spencer. Exactly. Thanks a lot. Spencer Skates, appreciate it. Julie, Josh, fantastic being on. Take care. Coming up, the holidays are here, so is the season of giving. Our next guest is going to help us break down which charitable organizations to support, how much money to donate as well this holiday season. That's next.
Black Friday sales hit a record $9.8 billion going into Giving Tuesday. But just because consumers are spending this holiday season doesn't mean they're giving. With seemingly endless causes to choose from, it can be overwhelming for donors to know how and where to give. For more on how to navigate Giving Tuesday, we bring in Charity Navigator, CEO and President Michael Thatcher. Michael, thank you for joining us. Josh, really glad to be here. Thank you. I'm interested, Michael, you know, we talk on this show a lot about some of the challenges that, that Americans are facing right now, right? So it's it's higher borrowing costs and elevated inflation. So as we wrap up, you know, just 2023, Michael, are Americans giving, you know, is it, is it at the same rate as last year, weaker, stronger? So giving overall in 2023, is actually down. It's down about 20%. Uh, that's what we're seeing on our site. And we're also seeing it from the nonprofits that we interact with. Roughly, it's about 20 to 30% declines in giving this year. That said, we're still hoping for a pretty good Giving Tuesday tomorrow. Mm. And do we tend to see a correlation between consumer spending and giving? Or you know, how do you think about how it relates to the, the broader environment? I think you'll see a, a tighter alignment with how's the economy doing and let's say consumer confidence in the economy. So if, if things are, you know, we've had higher in interest rates, we've had concerns about the economy, that has had an effect on giving. And so it tends to follow fairly closely. And so Michael, if there are folks who maybe are a bit concerned right now, there's some storm clouds brewing, are there ways that they can still give even if they're having to give on maybe a more tight budget right now? 100%, and I think that's where you wanna be smarter when you're giving right now. If you have less to give or you're less sure about where you're gonna be giving, be strategic, think it through. Um, use third-party intermediaries like Charity Navigator to actually figure out where to give and then how to give to an organization that's really making a difference. So um, one of the things you guys measure is how effectively the money is being spent, basically. Yep. You know, what percentage goes to overhead versus actually goes to the cause that the charity is working on. The site's been in existence now for 22 years, as we were just talking about in the yep. break. Have um, charities, foundations, nonprofits overall, have they gotten more efficient over time, have you found? Or is there still a big dispersion? It's a great question. And yes, there's, I would say there's a lot more focus on efficiency. But at the end of the day, you really want to know what has my money accomplished, right. right? So yes, we can look at how much gets spent on a specific line item in the, in the budget, but did the difference get made in the world? And so what we've been looking at in the, the way the ratings have evolved and the way a lot of people are thinking about nonprofit giving right now is what is the impact of my donation and then how do we actually determine that? And I think that's something I'd really encourage folks to look for. Mm. And Michael, on your on your platform right now, I'm curious whether are there certain trends, themes, areas people are are giving more to right now? Absolutely. And again, this similar to sort of global trends, people tend to follow the news cycle. We've had a lot of really difficult, hard things happening in the last year, and so giving tends to follow that. We're seeing a there's a large focus on humanitarian aid, international humanitarian aid. You'll also see a focus on the environment, education. These are key areas that always are in the top. You know, it's, it's, our cycles are around them, mm -hmm. and that's where people are giving right now. I, I'm also curious what you make of, particularly when you're talking about humanitarian aid for the situation in Israel and Gaza, for the yep. situation in Ukraine. Um, there's a lot of disinformation out there, both about the situation itself, but also about the organizations that are on the ground. Do you feel like you, have you all added an information or changed what you're sharing about these organizations to try to correct for some of that? Part of what we try and do at Charity Navigator is essentially help donors find the organizations that are focused on the causes they care about. So we'll create lists of highly rated organizations that are a good starting point for people. There is disinformation. There is fraudulent behavior. You have to watch out for that. Mm -hmm. So one thing, a couple of rules of thumb, make sure it's a real 501c3 IRS registered charity. You can look them up on and on any of the IRS site, Charity Navigator, any of the intermediary sites. And then the other thing is, how are they actually engaged in the process that you're trying to give give money to? And so you want to know that they're actually they have feet on the street doing the work that you're asking them to do. All right, Michael, thank you so much for coming in today. Really appreciate that insight. Excellent. Thanks appreciate for having it. me. And coming up, a box office blunder. Disney's latest cinematic release disappointing over the holiday weekend. And we're going to have those details for you on the other side of this break. Good morning.
morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Josh Schaefer along with Alexandra Canal and Brooke De Palma. And today we're looking at a few winners and losers of the holiday season thus far. And I want to start with Peloton, which wasn't so thankful for its virtual turkey burn class. It experienced quite a bit of hiccups. So Peloton running this special big streaming event to do a virtual class together, of course, on those at-home stationary bikes. 
and they had a couple hiccups that happened. Essentially, people that were trying to get on the class couldn't quite get access to it. It was pausing, freezing, mm -hmm. so on, so forth. So they couldn't ride together. Peloton CEO coming out and saying, we quote, let you down. That's CEO Barry McCarthy. He said a number of the members trying to join the ride overwhelmed the technical infrastructure and they weren't quite able to support it. Overall, just for a company that we know has been struggling to sort of reinvigorate its growth story here and really kind of keep its pitch to consumers, not necessarily a great sign. Yeah, I mean, Peloton doesn't need any more bad PR. Yeah. You, they, we've That's had right. that over the past few years. If you just take a look at the stock price, it's down more than 30% year to date, more than 45% over the year. And this was a company that really benefited from that pandemic boom. People were going out there, they were buying Pelotons, they weren't able to go to their local gym, and we saw the stock skyrocket during that yeah. time. But then when the reopening trade started, we really saw investors pull back and Peloton seemed really caught off guard in a way and didn't know how to bounce back in that new environment. And when you have something like this going on, that's not ideal. Yeah, and shares are far lower from where they were back in 2020. You mentioned that that peak, that heightened demand that it got during COVID. There we sure saw shares over $162. It's hard to believe that now we're trading around $5. And certainly when you think back to their numbers in the most recent quarter, we're looking at that subscription number. They came in at $415 million. That outpaced sales of their hardware, which is at 180.6 million. And I feel like Peloton really went into this thinking that hardware was the name of the game for them. This bike was the ideal price. And now with subscription outpacing that, it'll be interesting to see how this company continues to try to evolve. Well, th that's part of what the story was to me on Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if subscription is the pitch and you want me to sort of be in on the subscription with presumably my friends and other mm -hmm. people, right? It's yeah. why I would go on this turkey trot-esque thing I'm going to talk yeah. about it with my family on Thanksgiving after, right? Like, mm -hmm. we're going to do it. Maybe you did the separate. ride together. You're, you're, well, yeah, right. You're going to yeah. do it maybe separately, and then you talk about it with friends or whatever. I, the pitch to me kind of makes sense. I don't, are you guys in on the group, the group cycle, per se? Mm -hmm. I love cycle I classes, fun. but yeah. I prefer to, now that we can, I prefer to go in person. Sure. Because yeah. I do think there's a different environment. That being said, there is something that's attractive when you just want to do a quick 20 minutes on the bike and you go on a Peloton class. But the subscription business to me makes the most sense because you can do weight training, you can do stretching. You can do a turkey trot yeah. with you all your friends. It, totally. Oh, you literally, most likely. They have walking <laughs> classes. Hopefully. They have classes where, you know, you can walk or run and things like that, you could join your friends and do something. Yeah, and I do want to keep a close watch. They are launching that Tread Plus. They're mm -hmm. hoping that that also gets big, uh, big attention and lots of anticipation among its consumers. That's something that's a higher price point. And so lots of anticipation of that potentially relaunch after not doing so well in recent years. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see. Uh, we're also looking at the Thanksgiving box office, which brought in $172 million domestically, better than both last year and 2021. Still, some titles did better better than others and if you take a look at some of the movies that either debuted over this weekend or the weekend prior the hunger games prequel was actually number one there and that was followed by apple and sony's napoleon and then disney's wish just once again disappointing there for disney just 31.7 million expectations were for that animated film to gross between 40 to 50 million over the five day and it just got me thinking about how the past few years since the pandemic it's been different for the box office when yeah. it comes to this time of year, we really need to see a big flashy sequel, a big blockbuster to really drive some of those returns. And this year that was supposed to be Dune 2, but mm. then you have the Hollywood strikes, which pushed everything back into 2024. Mm. So there were some signs of life, which was encouraging, but it makes me think about the future of the Thanksgiving box office and whether the allure is is gone or whether that's just a programming issue on the side of studios. Yeah. I'm all in on Napoleon. I gotta go see <laughs> Are it. You? I'm so excited. Yeah, we'll I see it. That is the one movie that Napoleon, I actually have I love, heard about. I love a good history movie. Or uh, history some people are saying, though, that it actually is not super accurate, that there could be more detail, but I mean, how much I mean, you yeah, it's, a short film? Of, of course. Oh my right. God, Ridley but Scott. Apple TV, too. Like, I think Apple TV, obviously, I love. I've loved their quality over quantity sort of pitch and the way they've really done up production, mm -hmm. which is something that makes it worth going to see in theaters. I wonder if that's part of the story here. It's just parents. So box office up, right? But who's going? When you look at the movies that people went to, it, tell, it tells me 
wasn't really families bringing their kids, right? Otherwise, right. the Disney movie would have done better, Wish would have done better. And I wonder if that's just where we're at now, where maybe you don't bring your kids well, to the movies yeah. anymore. Why would you spend 60 to 70 bucks to bring your family to the movies when I mean, yeah. you could just wait a little bit? There's you so know. much content on Disney+. Right. Plus. I do think that was a part of the issue here for Disney, is there was an overproduction of content. And you mentioned quality over quantity, which is that been the strategy for Apple. That's something that Disney CEO Bob Iger really wants to bring over to Disney and really produce less films overall. Mm -hmm. But the ones that they are producing would hopefully bring the big box office yeah. returns. And, and two things here is the, the biggest grossing uh, grossing uh, movie that we saw is Frozen during a previous Thanksgiving weekend. That was back in 2013. That was the largest uh, film that we've seen over the Thanksgiving box office weekend. And what was different about that was it maybe was a bit of a different timeline. They really think that innovation is what Disney needs to do here. They need to bring viewers in with a totally different storyline, like Inside Out, mm. or completely new than opposed to just a character and another character, an item that they typically do. But but the sequels, to your point, is also a big deal. Like, if you have a Frozen 3 or a Frozen 4, which oh, that's both of which do great. I, Iger yeah. said is coming out, that's what you need around the fall to really bring you into that holiday push. So we'll see yeah. if Disney can deliver. Yeah, and another one that we're taking a closer look at is the airlines were big winners this Thanksgiving weekend with TSA reporting that Sunday was the busiest day ever for airports. And one carrier is debating a new way to cash in with United Airlines considering in-flight targeted ads. So what this means, guys, will be personalized ads that can appear on seat back screens. So those screens you have in the back of your seats, in-flight shopping catalogs. And we really have seen retail media, it's called now, a really boom in recent months and in really recent years, we see them from Walmart, Uber, Instacart, Home Depot, all benefiting from this idea that you can personalize, you could target ads, so you really do engage with a core demographic and then see returns on the other side. Yeah. I, it makes a ton of sense to me if you're United, especially because some of the companies you just mentioned, Brooke, I think they know about their consumer, but maybe not to the level that United might. United knows mm. where you're going. They their know gender, if you use miles right. and if you use miles to book a hotel, mm. they're gonna know that. You're right? a if frequent you pull those, flyer. If you pull those yeah, points how often over, you go to what kind of places. merchandise you buy, you might have a United credit card. Right. So they really know a lot about you. That's the pitch point. to advertisers to me makes more sense than even like an Uber or something. So I, I totally get it. Mm. Also, you have a lot of people going through TSA now. Yeah. Why not? Like, we're talking about record numbers going through TSA, but the airlines are still figuring out how to make more money off them, right? Mm -hmm. This is one way to make more money off having people sitting in your seat. Because we gotta make money. And Every you, you, time you're sitting down, we have right. to make as much money off it's, it's as true. possible. It's, That's what it feels like America. now. It's guaranteed eyeballs. Like, yeah. you're sitting in that seat. You're you being, have to sit You there. have to watch the ads. And out of home entertainment, so those ads out mm -hmm. of your home, that is the next frontier that when I talk to analysts and experts, that's what they say to look out for. And you're seeing the decline of linear advertising, that traditional ads that you see uh, when you watch a TV show on broadcast. But that's all transitioning into streaming, ads on right. streaming. Now we have all these companies trying to jump in on the trend too. And I, for me, I think it's just a super smart play. Right. I'm totally for it too. Yeah, and I, I don't know about you guys, like give me ad. more targeted ads. I will say, if I have to watch an ad, it better be yeah, something I'm interested make in. It, make but, it but a product to actually we, buy. We all like to complain that when we go on Instagram or we go on Facebook, we're getting tons of ads and we're getting these very targeted ads. Maybe something that we searched on, on the website is now on Instagram and, and Facebook or Snapchat or whatever else. But I'm so we'll for see that. if we actually I'm for like. It. I'm no, literally I'm for about it. to purchase an no iron. Here. Cyber Monday, give me the deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally going home and purchasing an iron that I was targeted for. So oh, yeah. perfect. <laughs> All right, well, stay with us. We will have a breakdown of everything you'll need to know tomorrow and what's going to be a pretty busy week on Wall Street. Stay tuned.
We got breaking news here. Chinese fast fashion giant Xi'an reportedly filing for an IPO confidentially. It's according to the Wall Street Journal. The company raised money earlier this year at a $66 billion valuation. So this coming from the journal here, um, Julie, and says that Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley apparently they've been hired as lead underwriters on the offering. Could happen, they're saying, in 2024. Valued at $66 billion in a fundraising round. That was in May. Of course, you know, investors know about this name, I think, Shein, because traditionally Amazon, just how they think about it, Amazon. I mean, Amazon used to, you always thought about rivals and competition. It was, you know, it was Walmart, it was Target, but now names like Shein have really started getting on the radar yeah, a bit I mean, more. Yeah, I mean, I think of Shein more uh, more with like a Zara or an H&M. It's fast fashion, but like super fast fashion and super cheap fashion. Um, now, we can talk about whether that's good for the state of the world, perhaps another time. <laughs> um, whether it's going to be good for shareholders, the private market, we'll see. The stock was, it, it's now based in Singapore, was originally um, based in China. Um, and it was valued at about $66 billion in a fundraising, fundraising round in May. Uh, Bloomberg had reported at the beginning of November that it could seek as much as 80 to $90 billion sure. in its IPO. But it's unclear if it will achieve that if it's had some down rounds or if it's had some uh, a tougher time raising money here. So we're still trying to get more information on this. They made headlines a couple of months ago by naming Marcelo uh, Clara, remember him, mm -hmm. um, uh, as vice chairman of Shin, and he's also sort of spearheading their strategy in Latin America. Of course, he's associated with SoftBank um, and Sprint, for that matter. So that was an interesting appointment, just sort of the building blocks that we were watching as they went towards this IPO. Yep, low-cost goods delivered fairly quickly that can attract a lot of fans pretty fast. Exactly. Right, Again, watch. debate over whether it's good for the world. But the, we'll, we'll, <laughs> yeah. hopefully we'll talk to them directly about that. Time now for What to Watch Tuesday on the earnings front. Investors can expect to hear quarterly results from CrowdStrike, Intuit, Workday, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise, all set to report after the market close on Tuesday. And turning to the economy, a new read on consumer confidence to be released for the month of November. After moderately dropping in October, marking a third straight month of declines, consumer confidence is expected to drop once again in November. And lastly, we're going to also be watching remarks from a number of Fed officials, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby, Fed Governors Christopher Waller, Michael Barr, and Michelle Bowman, all set to speak on Tuesday. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow. We'll be here at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a great night.